Good morning. Welcome to worship. I'm so thankful that you could be with us at Love's United Methodist Church. I know we cannot be here together in person in our sanctuary. However, I wanted to bring the sanctuary to you. Please know that wherever we worship, in our homes, in the church, that God is with us. So let us worship together. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 Dear God, it seems like lots of uncertainty around us. So many people who need prayers. Today I pray for those whose health is compromised by the coronavirus and other health issues. For those who suffer from the economic impact of the virus in travel, manufacturing, hospitality, energy, or so many other industries for healthcare workers and first responders and other public servants who put themselves in harm's way for us. For our leaders of the world, our countries, states, and cities as they seek to help manage this challenge. God, it can be overwhelming, but you tell us over and over again not to be afraid. Show me how to trust in you. As I examine my heart this Lenten season, help me to turn away from my concern with self and turn my heart, hands, and prayers toward the concerns of others. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, in the New Revised Standard Version. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophets, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth and Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Everyone loves a homecoming, especially when those coming home are our victors. In North Carolina, church homecomings are very popular. We like to welcome home our friends and our members and preachers of the past who have made a great impact on us or on the life of the church. When the Wright brothers came back to Dayton after flying for the first time, there was a parade. When the Apollo 11 astronauts came home from landing on the moon, there was a parade. Everyone loves when the victorious or those who are meaningful for us come home to celebrate. What Jesus encounters when he enters Jerusalem is this kind of celebration, and he knows it's coming. That's why in this passage, he asked the disciples to get a colt for him to ride in on. Now, why, you might ask, does he ride a colt? Some people say it is for humility. After all, an incoming king would ride a stallion, right? 
Well, maybe, but that's our image of a king, not the image of the Hebrew people. Jesus riding a colt may actually be more king-like than even a stallion. If anyone in Jerusalem knew their Bible well, they'd see this as fulfillment of prophecy. Zechariah 9, 9 says, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This prophecy was written in a time when the Hebrew people were desperate for a king, desperate to rejoice again. It may actually help us to understand some history when it comes to Palm Sunday. Zechariah 9 was probably written in what's called the Hellenistic period, a time when the Hebrew people were under the oppressive Greek regime. But it wasn't the first oppressive regime the Hebrew people suffered under. First, of course, we remember the Egyptians, people saved by God through Moses. Then there were the Assyrians who wiped out the northern tribes of Israel. Assyrians were conquered by the Babylonians, but that wasn't good for Israel. In 1587 BC, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and exiled its people. Less than 50 years later, King Cyrus of Persia overwhelmed Babylon and freed Israel. Isaiah 45 calls Cyrus a key word. Our translation is anointed. Also, Messiah. Messiah, the same word as Christ. From then on, Messiah was associated with overcoming oppression. So when the Greeks under Alexander came in and began oppressing the Hebrew people, naturally the people started calling for a Messiah, an anointed one to overthrow them. In came the family called the Maccabees. You may remember them from Hanukkah stories. The Maccabees overthrew the Greeks in 166 BC. When they defeated the Greeks, the people called them Messiah and brought back one more tradition, welcoming messiahs with palms. When Cyrus defeated the Babylonians, the Hebrew people returned to rebuild Jerusalem. They were led by Ezra, the scribe, and Nehemiah, the governor. And while rebuilding the temple, they found a copy of the law, the Torah. When they read the Torah, they noticed that they were to celebrate the festival booths in the seventh month. So they sent people out to cut palm branches to make booths, which are little tents for people to live. People rejoiced because they were no longer in captivity, no longer under oppression. So when the Maccabees freed the Hebrew people from the Greeks, people remembered this celebration. They brought out their palm branches to welcome Simon Maccabee into Jerusalem. Now fast forward nearly 200 years as Jesus enters Jerusalem. The Hebrew people again are under oppression and this time under Roman oppression. They're desperate for another Messiah or in Greek Christos, which is Christ. So as Jesus comes in, having gained great popularity, the people hope he's the Messiah. After all, he's riding on a colt. The leaders of the time are afraid of him. He might be the one. So they bring out the palm branches, they lay their cloaks in front of him, and they recite an old messianic psalm. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Make a procession with palm branches and welcome Jesus like a homecoming king. Of course, we know later that week, the crowd yelled something quite different at Jesus. Instead of Hosanna, they began to cry, crucify him. Instead of seeing him as a Messiah, they basically considered him a traitor. The palms were discarded by the side of the road as Jesus carried his cross to Calvary. They no longer saw the king riding on the colt. They abandoned him, rejected him. That's our nature, isn't it? We love winners, the victors coming home. Anyone we associate with losing, 
they're fine on their own. When life is good, it's easy to thank God, to praise God for good fortune. When times get tough, we ask, why God? Where did you go? But that's not God's nature. God, as Isaiah said, has his face set like stone. In good times, God is there. In bad times, God is there. If the crowds wouldn't have praised Jesus coming into Jerusalem, the stones would have. God is constant. God is steady. Christ is heading to the cross despite the Hosannas. And the good news is our King is coming home again, coming again to save us from oppression, coming again to set us free from slavery to sin and death, coming again to take his rightful throne in our hearts, that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When the world with hope all itself is good, and you have to get along bigger fair, just read. Everything that God in prayer. 
Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there. Love y'all. Let us pray. Gracious God, shrouded in mystery, yet revealed in Jesus, awesome in power, yet preferring to relate to us in gentleness, capable of commanding us, yet preferring to win us with love. We can but bow in awe, in wonder, in adoration, and in praise to you who are from age to age and to all of the ages. We thank you for the humble ride Jesus took into Jerusalem. Like those folk who greeted him that day, we wish to make him fit into our preconceptions. They were wishing a conqueror, instead he came as a gentle peacemaker. We wish him to be the one who blesses our wars, instead he loves all people equally. We wish him to make himself and you crystal clear and remove the ambiguity from life. Instead, he offers us a way and a path and the opportunity to walk by faith and the necessity to exercise simple trust. We would wish him to remove all sin and darkness from life. Instead, he offers us forgiveness. We'd wish him to remove life's obstacles and sufferings. Instead, he offers us his presence in trial and rejoicing. Be with us on this day, O God. May we be open to this life-changing Jesus. Cause us to be receptive of heart as we lean into this Holy Week. Teach us to temper our internal tantrums and demands and lead us to understand that most difficult virtue of humility. Be with those who are confronting life-changing situations. Be with those with chronic and debilitating illness whose grief and loss and frustration are compounded as their physical power wane. Be with those who have drunk the bitter cup of grief. Be to them a powerful presence. Bind up their wounds and grant them comfort. And bring our world peace, O Prince of Peace. Amen. Let us now pray together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. On the first Sunday of the month, we, in our sanctuary, have the opportunity to take communion. We have the cup and the bread, and we partake of them as a community of faith. We may not be together in person today, but we have an opportunity to practice another type of communion called the Love Beast. On our website, lovesumcwalkertown.org, you'll find a PDF of the Love Beast, which you can either do on your own or with others in your household. In the blood of Christ. United Methodist churches worldwide celebrate communion regularly. But there was a time when pastors had to travel long distances to reach churches. So instead of communion, members had a gathering known as a love feast. There were even special vessels to use in those early days, explains church historian Dale Patterson. If you ever see a cup displayed with three handles, it was probably a love feast cup. Methodists practiced a rite that we call the love feast. It has its roots way back in Christian history. Wesley bumped into it through uh, his contact with Moravians. Be present at our table, Lord. Be here and everywhere adored. Thy creatures bless and grant that thee may feast in fellowship with thee. Hello, it's me, Chuck, from Chuck Knows Church with another simple thing you can do during this time of crisis. Remember, there are things you can do.
With many churches only offering online worship services, what if we took a little more time to set up our space at home to prepare for our church's live stream broadcast? Light a candle, open a Bible, create an altar-like feel, play five minutes of preparatory music, a prelude, taking turns and the family picking the music each week. Maybe place the church directory on the table as a reminder of the wider community. Turn off the cell phone. Clear the space of distracting clutter for the duration of the service. It's too easy to be half attentive to the moment of worship, especially as we shift to live streaming. Find ways to make the time and the space holy, set apart from the rest of your week. May God the Father, our friend Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. As we journey into this holy week, may we recognize the sacrifice that Christ made for us as he journeyed to the cross. But may we also recognize the sacrifice that we're making for ourselves and for others as we stay safe, as we stay healthy, and as we flatten the curve. May this holy week have great impact for us, that as we journey into Easter, that we can truly recognize the celebration that it is.